solution for humanity. الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن ولا أما بعد All praise is due to Allah We send peace and blessings upon the messenger of Allah and upon his family and his companions Brothers and sisters Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh In this episode today we come to talk about what is really a huge watershed in the time of the history of the Muslims. A huge event, a calamity that shook the world of the Muslims and a calamity that led to a severe, severe trial befalling the Muslims and befalling the Ummah of Islam. Today we're going to talk about the assassination of Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu ta'ala an. Hudayfa radiallahu an, the secret keeper of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the one who used to ask the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam about evil in order not to fall into it. He said, we were with Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu an, and he said to us, who among you remembers the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam regarding the fitna, regarding the tribulation? He said, I remember it as he said it. He said, tell us. I said, I heard the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam say, the trial of a man is in his family, his wealth, his self, his son, and his neighbor. And it may be expiated by means of fasting, praying, giving charity, commanding what is good and forbidding what is evil. Umar said, it's not this that I'm talking about. It's not what I mean. I'm talking about the trial, the tribulation, the fitna that surges like the waves of the sea. The tribulation that surges like the waves of the sea. Hudayfa, at this point, Hudayfa knows what it is that Umar radiallahu an is referring to. And none of the other companions in the gathering know what is going on. And likewise, none of the other people in the gathering know what it is that Umar is talking about. What is this trial that is going to come that is going to be like the waves of the sea? What is this trial that's going to come that's going to surge like a tsunami against the Muslims? Hudayfa turns to Umar and says, what does that have to do with you or Amir al-Mu'mineen? Between you and it is a closed door. So at this point, Hudayfa says, you don't have anything to worry about, O Umar. Hudayfa, remember, used to ask the Prophet ﷺ about the evil in order to avoid it. He used to know about the tribulations and the trials. Perhaps he was the most knowledgeable of all of the companions of the Messenger of Allah ﷺ regarding the trials and tribulations and difficulties that were going to befall the Muslims. He said, you have no concern of this, O Umar. This is not a matter that should be concerning to you, O Umar. Between you and it is a closed door. So the Amir al-Mu'mineen, he turned and he said, 
Will the door be opened or will it be broken? So Hudayfa turned and said, rather the door will be broken. At this point there is an example going on. There is an example of a tsunami that is about to come. And there is a door or a wall, a defense that is stopping it from hitting the Muslims. And Hudayfa says for Umar not to worry because he is on the other side of the door. And then Umar asks, will the door be opened or will it be broken? Until this point, the companions don't understand what it is that Umar is referring to. Only Hudayfa and Umar, they're having a conversation in public, but nobody understands what they're talking about except the two of them. He said it will be broken. Then Umar said, then by Allah, it will never be closed until the hour begins. Abu Wa'il, the one who narrates this hadith from Hudayfa, he said to Hudayfa, did Umar know what was meant by the door? We're listening to you talking about a door, and a door that's going to be broken. Was there only you or Hudayfa who knew what this door is, or what is meant by the door? Or was it that Umar radiallahu an knew what was meant by the door? So Hudayfa turned and he said, he knew what was meant by the door. He said, yes, he knew it for certain. Then Abu Wa'il said, let us go and ask Hudayfa what is meant by the door. The secret keeper of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa The one who knew the secrets, who knew the names of the munafiqeen, who was entrusted with the secrets of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Radiallahu an. Let us go and ask him about the door. Look at the knowledge that the tabi'een they want to get. So they said, we will send Masruq to ask him. So Masruq went and he asked him, what is the door? Or who is the door? And Hudayfa radiallahu anhu replied, the door is Umar. Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu an was a door that was preventing a tsunami from attacking the Muslims. It was preventing a tsunami from striking the Muslims in every single place. Every time the munafiqeen made a plot, every time the hypocrites made a plot to attack the Muslims, they could not get past the door of Umar. They went left, they went right, they went to Iraq, they went to Syria, they went every single place that they could. Every time they made a plan, Umar was there. Every time they tried to attack the Muslims, Umar had already thought of a way by the success that was given to him by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to combat these hypocrites. The enemies of Islam tried in every single way. They tried through the spreading of doubts, they tried through misconceptions, they tried through military means, they tried in every way that they could to undermine the khilafah of the Muslims, to make the Muslims fight. But every time they tried, they found Umar. Umar who the Prophet sallallahu said, when the shaitan sees you coming on a path, he takes another path. When the shaitan sees you coming on a path, he takes another path. This was the nature of Umar. And Umar knew that he was that door. How did he know? Because the Prophet sallallahu had already told him. And Hudayfa knew because he was the secret keeper of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he knew more than many, if not all of the companions radiallahu anhum about the trials and tribulations that were going to happen because of his nature of asking about bad things and letting other people ask about good things. The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was on the Mount of Uhud and the Mount of Uhud began to shake. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam struck the mountain of Uhud with his foot. And he said, stand firm, O Uhud, for there is nothing on you but a prophet and a siddiq and two martyrs. There is nobody on you today at that moment in time except for a prophet and a siddiq, Abu Bakr siddiq, and two martyrs, Umar and Uthman radiallahu an. So Umar and Uthman both knew that they were going to be martyred for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Even though at many times they didn't know how this was going to happen. It was narrated from Zayd ibn Aslam that Umar said, Oh Allah, bless me with martyrdom for your sake 
and cause me to die in the land of your Prophet, in the city of your Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This was something from the strangest of things. How is it possible that Umar radiallahu an can be a martyr and can die in Medina? A martyr is going to die in the far regions of Iraq, in the direction of Persia, towards Khurasan. A martyr is going to die in Syria. A martyr is going to die in Egypt. How is a martyr going to die in the center of the capital city of the Muslims? The city of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. It was said to Umar, how could this possibly happen? He said, Allah may cause it to happen. I make dua, trusting in Allah, believing that Allah will answer me. And Allah Azza wa Jal will take care of things from there. Abu Musa al-Ash'ari radiallahu an said, I saw myself as if I had taken many horses. And then they started to disappear one after another after another until only one was left. I took it and I went to a particular mountain where I saw the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and Abu Bakr and he was gesturing Umar to come. The narrator said to Abu Musa, why don't you tell Umar about this? He said, I do not want to give him the news of his own death. So there were other companions who knew that Umar was going to die and they knew that the time for Umar to die was going to come close. It's now time for a break insha'Allah ta'ala and after the break, bi'idhnillahi ta'ala, we're going to talk about what happened in the actual assassination of Umar and the events that led up to it. Until then, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. the Quran upon the heart of the Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him he demonstrated that in a speech and action and the Muslim nation spent long years and great efforts for the preservation of his hadith. So join us for Hadith Story on Peace TV to know how the Ummah received, conveyed, and transmitted the honored legacy of the Prophet. Learn and appreciate the enormous efforts the scholars of Islam put into preserving the divine sayings and actions of the Prophet, peace be upon him, in the story of Hadith. Next on Peace TV. <laughs> We're talking about the breaking of the door. That was Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu an through his assassination. And at this time, the prisoners who were enslaved by the Muslim armies who were conquering the faraway lands were not given permission to enter into Medina. Umar did not wish for them to enter into Medina. Not that he didn't believe that there was any reason they couldn't come into Medina, but he didn't want Medina to be a place of insecurity. He didn't want Medina to become a place of misguidance. He wanted Medina to be a place of safety and a place of Islam. So Umar prohibited the prisoners of war from being brought into Medina until they became Muslim or unless they became Muslim, and then he would allow them to come into Medina to safeguard Medina. Some of the Sahaba radiallahu anhum had slaves who were conquered from various battles and that was the nature of prisoners of war at that time that the laws of war 
during the time that were adhered to by all of the empires that were fighting against each other is that prisoners of war would be taken as slaves. The difference is that Muslims treat their slaves far, far better than the non-Muslims treat theirs. In fact, it was said that they couldn't tell the difference between the slave and the master. They would dress from the same clothes, they would eat from the same food. They would walk together, they would live together, they couldn't tell the difference between them. Umar reluctantly gave permission to some of the Sahaba, some of the senior companions of the Prophet wasallam, for them to take their slaves into Medina, even though they weren't Muslim. And this shows that Umar did not believe there was a religious prohibition in them entering Medina. But that Umar simply wanted to protect Medina from negative influences, much in the way that Medina is protected today. Not for necessarily a religious command of the Prophet wasallam. although some of the scholars mention the hadith that there must be no two religions in the Arabian Peninsula. But for the reason that it protects Medina from negative external influences as much as is possible. The end result was that Umar radiallahu an gave permission to some of the slaves to settle in Medina and it was the decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that what Umar feared would come true. Amr ibn Maymun said, I was standing with no one between me and him, i.e. no one between me and Umar, but Abdullah ibn Abbas on the day that he was struck. When Umar would pass by the rows, he would say, make the rows straight. And when they were straight, he would step forward and he would make the takbir. He would recite Surah Yusuf or An-Nahl or a similar surah in the first raka'ah until all of the people had gathered. No sooner had he said the takbir, but I heard him say, the dog has killed or the dog has devoured me when he was stabbed. The foreigner who stabbed him tried to flee wielding a two-edged knife and he did not pass by anyone right or left except that he stabbed him. When the Muslim men saw that, they threw a cloak over him and when he realized that he had been caught, he killed himself. Umar took the hand of Abdul Rahman ibn Auf and made him go forward to lead the people in prayer. Those who were immediately behind Umar saw what had happened. Those who were in other parts of the masjid did not realize but they missed the sound of Umar's recitation. Abdul Rahman led them in a brief prayer and when they finished Umar turned to Ibn Abbas and said, Oh Ibn Abbas, see who killed me. He went around for a while and then he came and said, it was the slave of Al Mughira. Al Mughira was one of those noble companions radiallahu anhu who was allowed to bring their slaves into Medina. He said, was it the craftsman? He said, yes. Umar replied, may Allah curse him. I told his master to treat him well. Praise be to Allah who has not caused my death at the hands of a man who claimed to be a Muslim. This is the martyrdom of Umar. Al-Abbas was the one who had the most slaves at the time in Medina. He said, oh Umar, if you wish, we will kill all of them. Every single non-Muslim slave that is living in Medina, we will kill them in retribution for what one of them has done. Umar said, no. That is wrong. After they have learned your language and started to pray facing your Qibla and perform the Hajj as you do. As these people are starting to enter into Islam, as these people are not all like Abu Lu'lu al-Majusi, that individual who is referred to in this narration, Abu Lu'lu al-Majusi was the assassin who killed Umar ibn al-Khattab. And the reason that he killed him was the extreme resentment and hatred he had for the Muslims. And particularly the fact that he demanded a higher wage and better living conditions from Al-Mughira. And Umar judged between them in a way that was fair. And Umar commanded and required and ordered Al-Mughira radiallahu an to treat him well. But it was not enough for Abu Lu'lu al-Majusi. Instead, he kept within him this hatred of Islam and the Muslims, this absolute hatred of Islam and everything to do with Islam. He hated the fact that the Muslims had conquered his lands. He hated the fact that he was enslaved. He hated the fact that he did not get what he saw was his right from Al-Mughira. 
And most of all, he hated the one who he saw was the cause behind everything. And he saw this as being Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu. He had poisoned the tip of his blade. And he stabbed many Muslims on that day until they threw the cloak over him and were able to overpower him. Umar was carried to his house and we set off with him. It was as if no one had seen a calamity like this before. Some kind of juice or fruit or dates mixed with milk or water, we call it Nabid, was brought to him and he drank it. But they saw that when he drank it, it came out of his stomach. And some milk was brought to him and he drank it and they saw that it came out of his stomach. As soon as they saw the liquid pouring out of the stomach of Umar, they knew that Umar was going to die. He said, Oh Abdullah ibn Umar, see what debts I owe. The total came to 86,000 or something along those lines. He said, if the family of Umar can afford it, pay it off from what you collect from them. Otherwise, Bani Adi ibn Ka'ab, the tribe of Umar, collect it from them. And if their wealth is not enough, then ask Quraysh, but do not go any further than Quraysh. Pay off this money on my behalf and go to Aisha, the mother of the believers radiallahu anha, and say this to her. Say to her, Umar sends his salam. Do not say Amirul Mu'mineen today. Do not say that Umar is the chief of the believers today. For I am no longer the leader of the believers. Umar knows he's about to die. Don't say that I am Amirul Mu'mineen, but say that Umar gives his salam. Don't say the leader of the believers gives his salam. Say Umar gives his salam. Say Umar ibn al Khattab is asking permission to be buried with his two companions. He found Aisha weeping. And he said to Aisha this request, and Aisha radiallahu anha, she said, I had wanted this for myself, but today I give it up for him. Remember that the Prophet ﷺ was buried inside of Aisha's apartment. Her father was buried in the same apartment. Naturally, she thought, my husband is buried, my father is buried, it's my apartment, I will be buried with him. But she knew the virtue of Umar, and she knew how much the Prophet ﷺ and Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu would have wanted Umar to be buried there. And so she gave up her right for Umar. And that is a huge lesson for us. That she gave up her right, she gave up what she had the right to for Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu. Still, Umar didn't accept it. He said, when you bring me to be buried, ask her permission again. And if she gives permission, then bury me there. And if not, take me to the graveyard and bury me with the Muslims. Look at the humility of Umar. If he had commanded Aisha, how could Aisha have refused? But still look at the humility and the respect between the companions radiallahu ta'ala anhum wa ardahum. Before Umar radiallahu anhu passed away, he implemented a selection process. He implemented a process by which the new Khalifa could be chosen. And Umar he thought, he said, if I choose a caliph for you, then someone who is better than me has chosen a caliph already. I have a precedent in Abu Bakr choosing me. And if I don't choose a caliph for you, then someone who is better than me did not choose. I.e. the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, even though he indicated Abu Bakr and he knew that the people would automatically choose Abu Bakr radiallahu an, he did not specifically write a command saying Abu Bakr will be the Khalifa after me. So Umar said, if I choose, I have a precedent. If I don't choose, I have a precedent. Whatever I do, I have a precedent for me. But Umar, he did something different. He said, I'm going to leave you a group of people, people who I know that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was pleased with when he passed away Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. You may choose the Khalifa from any one of them. And he appointed Abdullah ibn Umar as someone to oversee the proceedings. And he said, Abdullah ibn Umar is not going to judge amongst you. He's not going to have a vote. Instead, Abdullah ibn Umar is going to observe the proceedings and he's going to assist you. And Umar gave them three days in which to make this decision. In the next episode, inshallah, we're going to hear about how Uthman radiallahu an was elected and the process that it took and the features of the Khilafah of Uthman radiallahu an. Until then, 
I leave you in the care of Allah. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. in the world addressing a sea of spellbound spectators over 30 world-renowned orators on Islam with credentials impeccable the truth of Islam Deen is your way of life it is our duty our obligation by following the Quran and Sunnah we will give the message to one and all, one and all. with articulation exquisite read the book of Allah Islam is the easy way it's the simple way remind each other the Muslim is not a source of harm for other people collaborate with the people for good this is the call of Islam with the mission of spreading the truth of Islam. Do what you can to spread the word of Islam. Wherever we are, live like Muslims. Use your power. Allah is saying, why do you need anything else? This Quran is self-sufficient. The only book on the face of the globe, the Quran. How a human being should lead his life is given in this instruction manual, manual the, glorious Quran. the glorious Quran. For peace to prevail on earth in peacemakers, Every Sunday to Friday at 10.30 p.m. and repeat telecast at 1 p.m. UK on Peace TV. The value of money in the hereafter will be measured by its proper use in the present. According to the glorious Quran, one of the best ways to use your money is to spend it in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by spreading his message of Islam. Peace TV is a non-profit Islamic satellite television channel that is primarily dedicated for just that cause the proper presentation of Islam. It's a great choice to invest in it and a golden opportunity to purify your wealth in a way that pleases Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Support Peace TV. Send your zakat and donations to IRFI Al Ryan Bank, 47 Calthorpe Road, Birmingham, UK. B151TH. Pound account number 0113230. IBAN GB49ARAY 3008301132301. Sort code 300083. Swift BIC code ARAY GB. B22. Please confirm your contribution at support at peacetv.tv. Support Peace TV, the solution for humanity.